Ellen, welcome back. Do you ever struggle with green? Do you ever look at the green in your artwork and wish that it had more personality and more pizzazz? Well, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to create your own gorgeous greens and save the tube green just in case of emergency. I paint a lot of landscapes and florals, so green is very important to me, and I use green in many color schemes of my artwork. And I've learned the hard way that while green straight from the tube is very convenient, it can be a little bit flat and uninspiring. And that's why I like to make my own. And if you're a watercolorist, the water and the pigment will do most of the work for you, giving you gorgeous results. So come on, I'll show you what I mean. In an earlier video, I talked about the art and science of color. So let's revisit the color wheel for just a minute. We know that when we mix two primaries, we get secondary. So in this case, if we mix yellow and blue, we will get green. But there are many shades of blue and there are many shades of yellow, which means we can get a wide variety of shades of green. One thing that is important for us to wrap our heads around is the fact that if we take blue and a blue that leans just a tiny bit toward red will give us a warm blue. So for example, ultramarine blue is a warm blue, um, indanthrene is a warm blue. If our blue leans a little bit toward yellow, it will be cooler. So some of our cool blues are phthalo blue, Prussian blue, manganese, phthalo, Windsor blue, those are considered cool blues. Guess what? The same applies for yellow. A yellow that leans toward red will be a warm yellow. For example, Indian yellow, one of my favorite colors, is a warm yellow. Yellow that leans toward blue will be a cooler yellow. So lemon yellow, cadmium yellow light, uh, Hansa yellow light or transparent yellow are all cool yellows. Now, a good rule to remember is that a cool yellow mixed with a cool blue will give you a bright green. And these bright greens are not necessarily the greens that you would find in nature, but they do have a place in our artwork. If we take a warm yellow and a warm blue, that will make a more natural, quieter, neutralized green. Now these rules apply not just to watercolor, but to acrylic, gouache, pastel, colored pencil, oil, you name it. Watercolor has its own special magic. By letting two colors mix on their own without a lot of intervention on your part, you'll get colors that are much more interesting and varied than if you take the same two colors, mix them together on the, pa the palette, and then apply to the paper. I'm especially pleased with how the leaves turned out on this bouquet of tulips. I basically let the blue and the yellow mix themselves on damp paper. And I really like the result. Here's another example. This leaf was painted with sap green straight from the tube and there's nothing wrong with it. it it's fine. And I use tube greens largely for convenience purposes. But look at the difference compared to this leaf. I dampened the shape and then I applied New Gamboge and French Ultramarine Blue onto the damp paper and I let the colors mix on their own. So as a result, you still see a little bit of yellow, you still see a little bit of blue, and they've combined in a way that makes for a very interesting green. So I have an idea for creating a collection of greens that we could use as a reference when we're planning artwork. So come on, I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to use an accordion sketchbook made with the same kind of watercolor paper that I use for larger paintings. Now I could have done this on a grid, 
but I want the paint to have room to play and show me what it will do on Arches 140 pound cold press paper. Inexpensive student grade paper would give me a different look and I, I never use it for real paintings. Now I'm adding boxes using a leftover from an insurance card that I recently received. It makes a great template for a rectangle. I've gathered a collection of blues and yellows from my cabinet and I'm going to just stick with quinacridone gold, Hansa yellow light, and Indian yellow. For my blues, I'm going to use cobalt blue, cerulean, ultramarine deep, and royal or endanthrene blue. I'm going to start with quinacridone gold and cobalt blue. I, uh, I love quinacridone gold. It is a gorgeous warm yellow. It's extremely transparent and very stable, very durable. It will not fade. And because I like to use cobalt blue in skies and backgrounds, I'm just want to see how it will behave with the quinacridone gold. So I'm pulling a little bit down on the plate, adding some clear water to, to create a little puddle that I can work with. I'm going to start by wetting the space. I want this rectangle to be very damp, but I don't want puddles. So I'm going to brush it all over uh, the surface and then I'm going to let it sit for just a minute to uh, kind of soak in a little bit. Now it's time for some watercolor magic. I'm going to add some quinacridone gold to the top left corner. As you can see, the paper's wet enough that this paint begins to move uh, without me doing much work at all. Clean my brush carefully, and then I'm going to add some cobalt blue to the bottom right corner. And the same thing. There's enough water on the paper and enough water in the paint for uh, things to begin to move on their own. Now my job right now is to use a minimum of brush strokes. I'm not painting the space. I'm really just dropping color in to this, um, onto this wet paper. As soon as those two edges get close enough that they will blend, I can kind of stand back and, and let the magic begin. I can see if I have enough water on the paper, I begin to tilt it backwards, forwards, sideways. What I want is for the cobalt blue and the quinacridone gold to mix and mingle. And again, I want to use a minimum of brush strokes. The more brushing I do, the um, the more I disturb the pigment, I want to see what happens on the paper, whether it settles into the uh, little nooks and crannies that are part of the nature of the paper, the characteristic of the paper. And right now I just have to, to uh, kind of move the paint back and forth, not with my brush, but by tilting the paper. I often use this same technique for mixing colors when I'm working on a painting. So if I'm um, working on a leaf or a petal of a flower, I'll wet the surface, drop in the colors that I want to mingle and mix uh, to create a new color, and then tilt my painting board or painting surface back and forth to move the color around. Again, not using the brush other than to drop in color and letting gravity do the work. Time for the next space. We're going to follow the same process. Wet the paper. We want to make sure that the whole space that we're going to be working on is well saturated, but not puddling. Uh, this time I'm going to work with quinacridone gold and cerulean blue. Same process. Bring a little bit of paint down onto the plate. Add some water so that I can get it to move on the uh, paper. And we'll start with the top left hand corner and do the same thing. A minimum of brushwork, dropping in the paint, and then we'll move on to the quinacridone gold in the bottom right hand corner and begin to see what happens when these two colors decide to get together and mix and mingle. I'm going to speed up the uh, footage on this so that you're not watching me 
fill in a blank space here, but I think you get the idea. And now I have a book of greens from sap green straight out of the tube to a variety of mixes with various blues and yellows. I love how I can refer to this when I'm planning a painting and begin to think about which one of these combinations would work best with the subject that I'm trying to interpret. Take a look at a close-up of these two panels, cerulean and quin gold on the left royal blue, and quin gold on the right. You can see the difference in the characteristics of the paint. Cerulean is a sedimentary paint, and so there are tiny little particles that settle into the nooks and crannies of the paper, whereas royal blue is much smoother, gives a much smoother finish. Um, the same held true when I uh, put cerulean with Hansa yellow and uh, the royal blue with Hansa yellow. This is what I love about these charts, is that you really get to know your paints and understand what they can and cannot do. So maybe you're wondering, how would I use a, a book like this or a, a color chart like this? Well, I like to use them when I'm planning for artwork. I really like to be able to see what the colors will do when they mingle so that I can make some good decisions. I like to work with a limited palette and I usually start by deciding on what are the main colors? What will the dominant colors be for a painting? For example, in this painting, I knew that yellow, yellows actually, both warm and cool, would be the dominant color uh, because they're in the, in the blooms of the tulips as well as on the tablecloth. And I wanted a cool blue as kind of a balance between that warm yellow I was going to use a cool blue for the background. Now, given that I knew what I wanted in yellow and blue, I used those two colors to create the green for the foliage. To me, it's just a better way for me to get started before I start slinging paint onto very expensive watercolor paper. That's it for now. It's time for you to play Mad Scientist and see how many greens you can make from the blues and yellows in your cabinet or paint drawer or on your palette. You might choose to make an accordion sketchbook like this, or maybe you want to just make a grid where you can see where the colors intersect. You'll, knew, you'll know what that new color is. So grab a piece of watercolor paper and let's get going. Pull out all your yellows, all your blues. If you know which ones are warm and which ones are cool colors, great. But if not, don't worry about it at this point in time. Just play. And I think you'll learn a lot by experimenting and seeing what happens when you let those two colors work together. If you're looking for a really great resource to better understand your watercolors, I highly recommend this book by Hazel Sloan, The Artist's Color Guide, Watercolor, Understanding the Palette, Pigments, and Properties. It is one of my personal favorites. The chapter on greens is really enlightening, and she gives you not only great references for how the colors play out, but she gives you great descriptions about which colors of blues and which yellows will generate which shades of green. So check it out if you're looking for a good resource. I hope you found this helpful. If so, please give it a thumbs up, and uh, if you haven't already, subscribe for more tips and demonstrations. Stay tuned for more color mixing. I think next time we will explore how to make gorgeous grays for those quiet places in your paintings. So, thanks for watching.
See you soon.